Welcome back to the McMaster University course Computer Science and Software Engineering 2FA3 Discrete Mathematics with Applications 2. My name is Bill Farmer and we're going to begin topic 2 of this course which is entitled Recursion and Induction. So what is recursion? For most of you, you're probably already familiar with recursion. It is a method of defining a function or a structure in terms of itself. And the important thing about recursion is it's one of the most fundamental ideas of computing. And using recursion can make specifications, descriptions, programs, all easier to write down, to understand, and to prove correct. So recursion is a very useful method. So how does recursion work? So let me um, just take a diagram here. So the, the way recursion works is we could have a problem. And there's a whole bunch of instances of this problem. And we want to be able to solve all of them. That's the key thing. We're going to solve a whole bunch of problems. And the way we do it is we start with the simplest instances. And we solve these first. There may only be one simplest instance. There may be a bunch. We figure out how to solve each of these individually. And then we look at a complex in instance, whatever that may be. And we say we have this complex instance, and we can solve it by breaking it down into some simpler instances. And our solution is, if we had solutions for the simple, simpler instances of the problem, we could solve the more complex. And then we break each of these down in the same way. And we get simpler ones. And we just keep we can just keep doing that until finally we get these simplest instances up here that we can solve immediately. So that's the basic idea. It's a divide and conquer um, strategy. And the, the idea again is we take our whole big space of instances of our problem and we solve the simplest ones immediately. This we can do because they're very simple. And then the more complex ones we break down into smaller problems and we're done. Now, one thing that's important about this is that when we solve a problem by recursion, what do we, and we're using a programming language, what do we really have to do? We have to solve these, these simplest cases and we have to figure out how to break down a complex problem. We do not have to go through and keep breaking it down. Our programming language will do that for us. We just have to tell the programming language how to solve the simplest cases and how to break down the complex case. Okay. Um, so that's recursion. What is induction? So induction is a method of proof. And this method of proof is based on an inductive set, which we're going to define a little later, a well-ordered, or a well-founded relation. So it's a method based on one of these three things. And this is one of the most, maybe the most important proof technique in computing. Um, now, the proof method is specified by what's called an induction principle. So there's various induction principles we can use. Um, um, induction is especially useful for proving properties for proving properties about recursively defined functions. Now, I want to point out a major source of confusion is that the terms recursion and induction are often used interchangeably. So someone could say we're going to prove something by recursion when they really mean induction, and they may say that this is a recursive definition, or they may say it's an inductive definition. So to avoid this 
confusion as much as possible, I will use, or in, the, or in this course, we will use the word recursion as a method of definition and induction as a method of proof. As much as we can, we'll follow that. Okay, so here's an outline for this topic. We're going to first talk about natural number recursion and induction. This is the most common kind of recursion and induction. It's the most is it most easy, easiest, and it's probably what you're most familiar with. Then we'll go to structural recursion induction, which is used quite a lot in computing. Um, we're going to need to talk about what well orders are. So we're going to take uh, a little break and talk about orders in general. Then we'll talk about ordinal recursion induction, which is based on well orders. Finally, we'll talk about well-founded recursion and induction. Um, ordinal recursion and well-founded recursion are not as commonly used as natural number recursion and induction and structural recursion and induction. And then we'll have a few things we'll do as a summary. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with natural number recursion and induction. Let's start with natural number recursion. So let's consider here, right here, we have this mathematical structure, the natural numbers with an order, a strict order, which is the usual order. That's the order that says 0 is less than 1, and 1 is less than 2, and 2 is less than 3, and so forth. Um, now, we may want to define a function by natural number recursion. So this function takes some inputs, gives some outputs. These inputs and outputs may have nothing to do with natural numbers. But we're going to define the function using natural number recursion. How do we do that? Well, our definition will look like this. It will say f applied to some input equals some expression. Now, often students are confused by this expression. I'm, I'm trying to write here an arbitrary expression. So if we go back here and think, well, what does this expression look like? What does this definition look like? It looks like just like this. And I have some big expression here. Or it might be a little one. And in this expression, there could be some recursive calls to f, which I have, I have written them like this. So we apply f to something that involves x. And maybe in some other part of our big expression, we apply f to something involves x. And there could be a whole bunch of these. So the, the important thing is this, what I have in this box symbolizes an expression. And it can be big or small, it can be very complicated, it could be simple. We'll see an example in a moment. So we have this big expression, and every for every input, I assign a complexity. Now all the complexity in this case is a natural number. I assign to every input a natural number. And then I make sure that each recursive call, the complexity of the input to that recursive call is less than the complexity of the input of the, the input of the function that I'm defining, or the, the, the input for the where I'm defining the function. Let's let's try to make that clear. So I have a, I'm going to give a complexity to this and a complexity to all these. Maybe I'll write like this. This is this is C. This is C0, C2, C1. And what I want to make sure is that C0, C1, and C2 are strictly less than C. And these are all natural numbers. That's what I have to make sure of. If I make sure of that, then my definition makes sense. And why does it make sense? Well, it makes sense because the natural numbers is Noetherian. Noetherian. This is named after a great female mathematician named Emmy Nierke. For you, for you students who've taken Computer Science 1JC3, I hope you remember her from that course. Okay, so what does it mean 
for the natural numbers. I mean, Noetherian, it means if I have a descending sequence, so I pick a natural number, and then I have another one, and it's smaller, and another one, and it's smaller, and another one, and smaller, that descending sequence cannot be infinite. At some point, it will have to stop, or at the very least, it will end up with zero. It, it, will, it can't go on forever. So that's what the natural numbers means to be Noetherian. And so if I know that the complexity of the arguments to my function calls are always smaller, as I keep applying my equation over and over again, at some point it has to stop. I have to get to those simplest cases that I can solve and we're done. So if I write down a definition, so let's go back here. If I write down a definition, I have this box, and let's say this is not true. This is not true. Maybe, for instance, c is equal to, c2 is equal to c, then I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. My definition really won't work. It won't make sense. If I implement a programming language, it's very possible, depending how things are, the language works, it's very possible my application function will just run forever. So this is an example of being a recursive definition that's nonsensical. So this is natural number recursion. And when you write down a recursive definition in a programming language, you don't, you don't probably, the language doesn't ask you to figure out this complexity, but you ought to know what this complexity is if you really expect the, line, the definition to make sense. Okay, so let's take an example, a very common example. This is example H. It takes as input a natural number, a natural number, and a function from the natural numbers to the reals. And it's defined like this. So I have M, N, and F, my three inputs. And if M is greater than N, we return zero. Otherwise, we return F applied to N plus H, and this is a recursive call of H, H applied to M, and N minus one, and F. And if you think a moment, this function defines this notation. What's called big sigma, it, or you can call it the iterated summation notation. Now the question is, does this definition make sense? If it makes sense, according to natural number recursion, we should be able to assign each input, and in this case an input is a triple, we should be able to assign to each input a natural number, and when we have this recursive call. The natural number of the original input should be greater, strictly greater than the natural number assigned to the input in our definition. And so here's how I can assign the complexity to each triple M, N, and F. If M is greater than N, that corresponds to this case, I will assign zero. Otherwise, I will assign N minus M plus one. You may wonder, well, the thing to notice is that, is that if I apply this, basically I'm saying that this equals, we use this notation, this equals f of n plus this. So what we're doing is the distance, you can think, where the difference between m and n minus 1 gets smaller. So this is a sign that, that our definition makes sense. We're, we're reducing the problem to a smaller problem. In this problem, we had to go from n, m to n. Here we just go from m to n minus 1. So you may wonder well, why we have this plus. Well, if n and m are the same, then that would be a case where we're going from one number to the same number. In that case, we give a complexity of one. And, and if we had a complexity of one, we would go, the next step would be, we would apply H to something where M is greater than N, and we would get to the simplest case, the case when M is greater than N, which is zero. So here, the simplest case is this. This is our base case. I, I, I really should say this is our base case. And this is the general complex case that we break down. Okay, now the, the critical thing we have to check is this. We have to check that this is always true. Well, it is always true. 
It's always true because if I reduce n, if I make n smaller, then this whole thing is small. So this is an example of a recursively defined function where our definition is based on the natural numbers, based on assigning uh, complexities, which are the natural numbers. OK, so let's go to natural number induction. Now, I want to mention something about this topic that's important. This topic is about recursion and induction. But we will spend much more time on induction than recursion because you've already seen recursion. You've probably always written lots of programs that are recursive. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time on induction because that won't be as familiar to you. But hopefully, you've already seen induction at some point, maybe in high school. Um, so, and you, if you've seen induction, you've probably seen natural number induction. So let's start off. Um, there's something called weak induction. Now, this is also called mathematical induction. But we're going to call it weak induction. This is an induction principle for the natural numbers. And here's how the principle works. We have a property of the natural numbers. A property is just a predicate. Uh, it's a, you can think of it like this. It's a predicate that takes a natural number and gives back a Boolean value. So we have a predicate takes a natural number, gives back a Boolean value. And we want a principle that will tell us when this predicate holds for all natural numbers. So what do we need to show in order to show that the predicate holds for all natural numbers? Well, there's two things. We need to show that the predicate holds, or the property holds, at the base case, which is 0. And we need to also show that if we know, it sh if we know the property holds at x, then the property will hold at x plus 1. We have to show that for all x. So if we know it holds at 0, and we know that whenever it holds at x, it will also hold x plus 1, then we can conclude that it holds for all natural numbers. That's what weak induction says. OK, so let's look at strong induction. Again, this is a, this is a method for showing that a property holds for all natural numbers. Here what we have to show is that for every x, for all x, let's say, for all x, we have to show that we can conclude that the property holds for x if it holds, if the property holds for every y less than x. So if the property holds for every y less than x, and it holds for x, and that's true for all x, then we can conclude that the principle, by the principle, that the property holds for all natural numbers. So we have these two principles, weak, strong. Um, now, the second principle is also, also called complete induction, course of values induction, may have some other names. And we have a theorem. The following are equivalent. And as you know from our last topic, the following are equivalent means that these two things are logically equivalent. It means that 1 implies 2, and 2 implies 1. Now, this may seem a little bit surprising. One is called weak and one is called strong. Why are they both equivalent? Well, they are both equivalent. Anything you can prove with weak induction, you can prove with strong induction and vice versa. You will see in a moment why we call one weak and why we call the other strong. So, let's review these two. So we have weak induction. And in weak induction, we're going to have a base case when x equals 0. And in that case, we're going to show, we're going to try to show this. That's the base case. And in the induction step, when x is greater than or equal to 0, we're going to try to show this, that x plus 1 holds. But we can assume this. This will be our induction hypothesis. We, we can assume this fact to help us prove that. And so you see, here's where the induction hypothesis sits in, in our induction schema. Notice we don't have an induction hypothesis for the base case. There isn't any real induction hypothesis for the base case. OK, so, so we have this induction hypothesis. p of x, we can use to prove p of x plus 1. Now, for strong induction, it works similarly. We're going to have a base case. 
The base case is when we're trying to prove p of x here when x is 0 and we can use as a induction hypothesis p of y for all y less than 0. But there is there are no y's less than 0. So basically we have no no induction hypothesis. So the base case is very similar for weak induction. The induction step though is different. We have a much stronger induction hypothesis. When we're trying to show p of x, we can assume that p of y holds for all y less than x. So if we're trying to prove p of 1 million, we know that we can assume that p holds for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way up to 999,999. So it's a much stronger induction hypothesis. That is why strong induction is called strong. Strong induction provides a stronger induction hypothesis than weak induction, but they're both equivalent. Logically, they are equivalent. Anything you can prove with weak induction, you can prove with strong induction, and vice versa. Okay, so let's look at a simple example of weak induction. So here's the formula or theorem we want to prove. For all natural numbers, this is true. And what this says is that the sum of 2i from i equals 0 to n minus 1 equals 2 to the n minus 1. Um, there is a connection, many, I don't know if any of you watch March Madness, which is a college basketball tournament, it happens every year in the U.S. This theorem has something to do with March Madness. If any of you can remember, when we have a discussion, next discussion session, you can ask me what this theorem has, with, has to do with March Madness, but it does. I'll give you a hint. In March Madness, the, at least in, it's a little different now, but the old way was there were 64 teams, single elimination, and uh, in the end, one team becomes a champion. How many games are played in March Madness? This theorem tells you. Okay, well, let's go on to how we're going to prove this. The first thing, which is very important, is you need to write down what the property is. One of the biggest mistakes students make is they just jump right into a proof by induction and they're, they're not clear about what the property is. They get all confused. You need to write down what the property is. Here's the problem. The property comes right from the theorem. This is the problem. And we want to prove this property for all n. And we want to be clear. We're going to prove it with this induction schema, scheme or I should say principle, this induction principle, weak induction. So with weak induction, we have a base case where n equals 0. And by the way, weak induction can be used where the base case may not be 0. It could be basically any natural number. It could be 1. Often it's 1. It could be minus 6. It's just the starting point. It's the simplest case. Often the sim Most often the simplest case is 0, but it doesn't have to be 0. Um, So in this case, it's 0. We want to prove p of 0. So here's what p is. We know n is 0, so we replace this n with 0. That's what we get here. And now we have the summation from 0 to minus 1. That's the special case when m is greater than n, and we know that's 0. That answer is 0. And we also know that 2 to the 0 is 1. So we have 1 minus 1, and we know that's zero. OK, so the base case is done. It's pretty, pretty easy. Induction step. The induction step, we, shoot, we, sh we assume n is greater than or equal to 0. So it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Actually, it could be any natural number. But the important thing is we're going to assume this. Let me remind you why we assume that. Because that's in this part of the principle. We can assume that. Remember I said if you're, if you're going to try to prove something in this form, how do you do it? You assume A and use it to prove B. That's what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. We're going to assume P of N. And we're going to show P of N plus 1. 
Okay, so so what do we do? Um, we write down p, p of n plus 1. Here it is. This is p of n plus 1. And then uh, we're going to have basically a two-column proof. These are going to be our statements. And these are going to be our reasons why these statements are true. So we do a little manipulation with arithmetic to get this. And then we're going from 0 to n. If we go from 0 to n minus 1, the last term will be 2 to the n. And now this, this is, this, we, can use, we can use this property, the property of n, to figure out what this is. And the property of n says, right here is the property of n, says this is going to equal, right here, to the n minus 1, there's 2 to the n minus 1. Now it's just arithmetic. 2 to the n plus 2 to the n is 2 times 2 to the n, which is 2 to the n plus 1, minus 1. And that's what we had to prove. That's, that's the right-hand side of the property for n plus 1. And so it's, I think it's always important at the end to say that the theorem holds by weak induction. Make it completely clear to the reader how your proof works. Okay, so that's weak induction. Let's look at strong induction. Different theorem. If we have a natural number with n greater than, greater than or equal to 2, then n is a product of prime numbers. So that's true for any number. So if we had 10, 10 equals 2 times 5. 8 equals a product of prime numbers. Okay, so let's get clear what our property is. Our property is that n equals a product of prime numbers um, where m is greater than or equal to 0. So if we just had one prime, we'd call it p, just be p0. And these p's are all prime numbers. That's what the property is. That P of n e equals some product of prime numbers, which could be a single number. Okay, and we're going to prove P of n for all n greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to 2 by strong induction. So a strong induction, our base case is going to be when n equals 2, and we're going to show P of 2. But P of 2 is almost trivial because 2 is a prime number. So here we have 2 is a product of primes, because it's a product itself. So we're done with that. Okay, now we're going to assume that n is greater than 2. We're going to assume n is greater than 2, and we're going to show p of n. But we can assume p of, p of 2, p of 3, p of 4, all the way up to p of n minus 1. Okay, so this proof breaks into two cases. n might be a prime number. In that case, P of n holds. It just holds the same way as 2. If, if P is prime, let's say it's 31, then 31 is a product of prime numbers. So if n is prime, it's pretty easy. But, so let's say n is not prime. If n is not prime, it's going to be a product of x times y, and x and y will be between 2 and n minus 1. Well, if they're between 2 and n minus 1, then we can use one of these one of these properties here. Because basically, we know, because x and y are less than n minus 1, we can use property x and property y. And what does property x say? It says x is a product of primes. What does property y say? It says y is a property of primes, or a, a product of primes. If we t put those two uh products together, we get this, and that says n is a product of primes. So P of n holds, therefore the theorem holds by strong induction. Okay. Okay, so let's review what the general form of a proof by induction is. We're going to see lots of proof by induction. Here we had two different induction principles, weak induction and strong induction. We're going to see other induction principles. But the proofs are all going to be the same. The first thing is you have to identify the property you're trying to prove. Then you're going to 
identify what the theorem is you're trying to prove, which is going to look like this. It's going to be for all x in some set, the property of x holds. Like in the last case, we had all n in this set, the set, let's see, set of all natural numbers starting at 2. So anyway, the set can vary, but we're, our theorem is going to be for all x in that set, the property holds. And then we have to figure out what induction principle we're going to use. We'll have often choices. We'll choose an appropriate one. And then we verify the cases for the induction principle. And what the cases are depends on the principle, depends on the problem. But we're going to have one or more base cases usually, and one or more induction steps. And then we have a concluding statement that the theorem has been proved by the induction principle. If you go back up and look at my two examples, you'll see I followed this approach exactly. Okay. Um, that concludes our um, lecture today. I just want to point out our next, next lecture will be in structural recursion and induction. So thank you all for listening. See you next time.